Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Can Do and the Natural Resource Canada's Mining Opportunity for Indigenous Communities in Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, this is part of an ongoing series of uh, mining opportunity um, tools um, that have been developed uh, jointly between Can Do and Natural Resources Canada that are featured on Can Do's website at edo.ca. Uh, please go to the top menu and under EDO tools, under three or four um, steps um, below the top, you'll see um, mining and exploration resources. Um, today with us, um, we have Dave uh, Lefebure, who's um, a professional geologist uh, with industry and government experience, um, who has delivered numerous workshops um, explaining um, mineral exploration and mining um, to Indigenous communities. Um, Dave was instrumental in developing the resources and tools for uh, BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. And um, Dave will also be presenting in a few weeks um, for opportunities for Nova Scotia. Uh, that's going to be on March 8th. So if you're interested in that, um, there should be information on the website and also in uh, the Can Do Weekly Newsletter. Um, Dave Lefebure, take it away. Thanks, Paul. Nice to hear that we have a good turnout and uh, with a lot of experience in different areas. And so I look forward to some questions as we go through this presentation. I'm speaking to you from Salt Spring Island, British Columbia, which is located on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples. I acknowledge and respect the Penelicut, Alalt, Cowichan, Malahat, Seacom, Saanich, and Sawit First Nations that are all have interests in Salt Spring Island and this general part of uh, British Columbia. Sorry, okay. So I would like to start with, before I show my first slide, just to mention that uh, Canada is one of the leading mining nations uh, in the world. Uh, some of the other countries that are, 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 are world leaders are Australia and Brazil, at least in terms of uh, democracies and uh, sort of uh, the, but along with that, uh, one of the things that I think is very interesting about Canada is it's a world leader in mineral exploration and mining companies trying to do a better job of uh, respecting the people who live on the land, who have a traditional interest in the land, and also trying to protect uh, the environment while they work and uh, following up with reclamation. And governments like uh, the government for Newfoundland and Labrador are played a critical role in getting uh, industry to be much more uh, progressive about how they deal uh, both with the land and with the people who have an interest in the land. And uh, I would go to say that uh, Canada's international presence and Canadian companies that work overseas have been able to show leadership in these areas in other countries. So I think we should be proud of it. It doesn't mean that there aren't, uh, that we, Canada doesn't have to go further, but uh, I'm proud to be a Canadian and to be associated with the mineral exploration and mining sector. Uh, I'm gonna give you a very quick overview. Uh, the webinar will be available for later. So I don't, it's more to give you an impression of what mineral exploration and mining is like and some of the opportunities for indigenous communities with respect to those activities. Uh, and so it's, I'm gonna give you a lot of information, trying to make it easier to follow by giving you lots of pictures. Okay, so, oops, okay. So my role today, sorry, okay. I'm going to share some examples of indigenous business opportunities related to mining. I'm going to explain mining in everyday language. I'm going to share some insights into this unique sector. Sorry, I'm just got to fix. Oh. We need to remember that mining is a natural resource sector. It's like forest forestry, but there's a huge problem that you can't find the uh, count the new mines the way you count trees. They're hidden. And that makes for a, a quite a different sector than forestry in a lot of ways. It's like the technology industry, another very high risk sector. 
but the activity often occurs in challenging and remote environments. So it has a very different flavor to it that way. And you'll see this with some of the pictures I'm showing. And it's very different from the oil and gas sector, the other extractive industry. So mining does have this very um, um, different character to it. And uh, I'll be trying to expose that to you today. Why talk about mining with a group like this? Well, jobs and contracts. Mining is the number two employer of Indigenous people across Canada. Uh, number, number one is uh, various government organizations. There are numerous agreements now in Canada with Indigenous communities with potential for significant benefits. Uh, particular to Newfound Land and Labrador is the mines are spread across these, uh, the province. So they're in remote, rural, and suburban locations. If you think of sand and gravel pits, they're often very close uh, to uh, where much of the demand is for their products. And then the fourth part, which is perhaps why you're tuning in today, the mining sector is not well known. Many people have never visited a mine or learned about them. And so uh, it's, uh, it's not a very well understood sector of the, the uh, Canadian economy. You don't wanna miss the economic development opportunities that might be in your region. And so that's why you should be paying attention perhaps. Now with indigenous people, uh, they've had a long involvement uh, with minerals. Uh, they've traded rocks and minerals and metals. They were the first explorers. And in some cases, they have been the first to find some very significant mineral deposits in Canada. But they were using stone, shirt, obsidian, copper, gold uh, uh, for, uh, for as long as they've been on the land. These minerals were highly prized and culturally important. And uh, just showing some arrowheads uh, related to Mi'kmaq. There, sir. Um, so I'm gonna give you an introduction. Then I'm gonna talk about the opportunities. The, uh, sorry, I just have to turn this off, sorry. Um, uh, opportunities for indigenous mining jobs, businesses and agreements. Uh, we'll get a, a quick question and answer session. Then I'm gonna talk about the life cycle of mining. This information is, uh, has Newfoundland and Labrador examples of, of it and pictures for that area, but it's similar to uh, the life cycle of mining that's been discussed in the other mining webinars. And then I'll end with a few key points relevant to economic development officers related to mining, and then we'll have this final question and answer session. Uh, why is mining not well known? Well, it's not generally taught in schools. Uh, many mines are in remote and rural areas, so people just don't actually even see them, much less get onto the sites. Access to these industrial sites is restricted for safety reasons. And so uh, while I've been on lots of tours of mine sites, particularly in Western Canada, uh, and including one in Newfoundland while I was there on a, a field trip, but uh, the, it, it's, it's just, they are, it's a heavy industry and uh, there are good reasons for people not just being able to come easily onto the site. That said, mining is typically the safest heavy industry in Canada. Uh, and has very uh, modern mining, I should say, uh, not historical mining, but modern mining. And uh, that's uh, true for Newfoundland and Labrador as it is for other provinces, areas in the country. Uh, not well known, well, by the time you see the mining products, you often don't really think about where they've come from, what, the fact that they've come out of the ground because you're seeing it as processed product. And I have to also say the mining sector tend, has tended in the past to focus on what they're doing rather than trying to reach out and tell the public what's going on. Uh, do you know the following highlights about the mining sector in Newfoundland and Labrador? I'm actually assuming based on what I've heard is a lot of you will not necessarily know these. Uh, mines of many sizes in Newfoundland and Labrador, some small sand and gravel uh, and some small quarries and some very large, sticky iron mines in the Western Labrador. Um, there are many mine products. There are metals like uh, gold, uh, nickel, uh, there is sand and gravel from pits, and that's critical infrastructure and industrial minerals like limestone quarries. Uh, mineral exploration is the first step to finding a new mine, uh, particularly for uh, metal mines uh, and some quarries. Uh, one of the interesting things about that is a lot of this is done in remote areas, and so it tends to be spread across a province like uh, Newfoundland and Labrador. There's a variety of entry level jobs associated with exploration. That's a good way for, for people to get some work experience that then they can get into more skilled jobs. Many of these jobs are outdoors. And so that's 
different than uh, a lot of job settings for other sectors. Uh, one of the challenges there is it's considerable seasonal work as some activities are not carried out for expiration in the winter. 2022, uh, across the province, $80 million was spent. And uh, certainly quite a bit of that would have been a potential for Indigenous communities to be involved with in terms of either jobs or contracts. Mining activity in 2022, and I'm showing you federal, uh, the provincial government information here. They had there were 13 producing mines in, in the, the province, two processing facilities, and actually, of the producing mines in Labrador City and Shefferville areas, there are uh, several iron producing mines. There is the, the famous Boise's Bay nickel copper cobalt uh, mine near Nain in Labrador. And then there's a lot of gold activity, thinking exploration uh, with uh, a couple of gold mines uh, and some other uh, projects going into uh, uh, trying to get into become mines. There are two processing facilities in the province, the Vale Hydromet plant, which processes the ore from Boise's Bay to recover nickel co and copper and eventually cobalt. And uh, there's the Rambler Maritime Facility that's on uh, Newfoundland uh, itself, the um, island of Newfoundland, and uh, that's a copper gold uh, facility of recovery. There are seven mine development projects and they're listed in, on the bottom left of the slide and there are over 700 exploration projects. Uh, lots of prospecting activities that aren't uh, um, captured, at least in the general reports. Uh, mineral resource products, there's the metals. I mentioned a number of them, but it also includes antimony and rare earth elements that could be produced from uh, sites in Newfoundland. There's industrial rocks and minerals like fluorospar, limestone, dolomite, construction minerals. Uh, and so these are all uh, important uh, things. We're looking at $6.5 billion worth of production of these commodities in 2021. And, uh, oops, sorry, um, excuse me. The, uh, and Newfoundland is a key producer uh, of both nickel and iron ore, as we'll see later in the presentation. Canada is the sixth largest producer of nickel, a very important uh, and critical mineral, and eighth largest producer of iron ore, uh, which is used uh, primarily for making steel and so many products. Uh, and there is uh, information available on an annual basis uh, from the Newfoundland Labrador government. Uh, if you're trying to get an update on what's happening in the province, this is probably the best go-to uh, uh, reference. Just going to talk briefly about critical minerals for Canada and Newfoundland and Labrador. I'm going to put in more slides in the Nova Scotia presentation, but they're essential to the economic success of Canada and, and our trading partners. Uh, Canada currently produces 21 of the 31 critical minerals on the national list. Uh, there are associated both federal and provincial and territorial initiatives aimed at growing production of our critical minerals, which are important now. Newfoundland Labrador has mineral occurrences for 24 critical minerals, uh, uh, but these would have to see much more exploration work and, and then obviously development for them to become actual produced products, most of them. There is a, a $5.2 million project by the Newfoundland and Labrador government to, to deliver more geoscience to help people explore for and, uh, and, and develop new mines related to critical minerals in the province. I'm not gonna talk about sand and gravel pits and quarries in this presentation, but there is information available from the provincial government. Uh, they are incredibly important for construction products, for buildings, roads, and infrastructure. Uh, the image shows you, uh, you can sort of see inside that, uh, uh, wrench uh, outline there, some gravel quarries. And uh, you can go online and see uh, this uh, satellite image with the uh, tenures for these uh, sand and gravel pits and quarries on it and see the information. The one in red is shows it's a sand and gravel pit and indicates who owns it. Uh, so that's very useful information, but I'm not gonna focus on that. Uh, they tend to be smaller operations and while they, they are, might be of interest in the indigenous community to develop their own company around a sand and gravel pit because the, the capital cost there is not that high, uh, 
they are not uh, normally the main area that indigenous communities get involved in uh, with respect to mining. Blood mineral mining, uh, big deal. Almost 8,000 jobs in the mineral sector in Newfoundland and Labrador. And you can see that the, the number of uh, jobs in Newfoundland has been grow and Labrador has been growing over the last four years. Uh, and based on what's been happening this past year, I would expect it to grow again for 2022. There actually are many attractive jobs that build work skills, work skills, picky uh, uh, in, in the mine sites. And so that uh, while we have, some of us may have a, a vision of what historical mine jobs are like, modern mine jobs, as you'll see in some of these uh, slides, are, are quite dis, uh, different. Another reason for being quite interested in this as an indigenous community is these jobs are across the province. Uh, whereas there are other sectors where uh, the jobs are more restricted in their aerial distribution. A wide variety of jobs, so we're not going to focus on this in, in this presentation, but there are over 160 different uh, mining jobs. And uh, some of these are, you know, like accountants and uh, administration and, uh, uh, you know, if it's a, a remote camp, cooks and uh, kitchen staff. And so there's quite a variety of jobs there uh, that present opportunities for employment. Just talking a bit about Boise's Bay mine, uh, it, it started as an open pit, uh, and but that open pit is being, uh, was being mined out through the 2021-22. So they began construction in 2016. So that's now uh, seven years ago to develop two new underground mines to chase more ore at depth. And this is very valuable ore. Uh, to uh, put it through their mill and continue the mine life for 15 years. More than 350 Aboriginal people participated in the training. Uh, and since 2016, the Inuit, Nunet Sibut, Inuit employment has more than doubled to approximately 500 employees on the site. And 65% of all procurement contracts awarded by uh, Valet, the company that runs it, have gone to Indigenous owned businesses. So that's a an incredible uh, source of economic um, development and benefits in that part of, of the world. There's the open pit. You can see now there, the, there's the underground access. Uh, and uh, I'm repeating some of the stuff there, but the uh, it's just more information about it. I'm, mainly I wanna show you the pictures of what, what it looks like there. Uh, and I've superimposed on this, uh, the jobs that are all available, uh, actually all of them have just closed, except there is one right at the top for a mill janitor on February 24th, and I don't know if there's one other, but that's, that's a lot of different jobs. Obviously, some of them require a lot of high degree of skills, but other ones are entry-level jobs. And it's just a reflection that as they've shifted from open pit to underground, that produces a lot more uh, a lot higher proportion of people who are required to support the mine uh, in an underground operation from a simpler open pit mine. Uh, they worked with the Abra Labrador Aboriginal Training Partnership to uh, provide that training. Uh, and uh, they targeted the training for various types of jobs with respect to the connection to Valet's uh, uh, Boise Bay's mine uh, to specifically do it. And the bottom picture on the right shows a, a, a person being trained offsite in, in a sort of computer generated images to, to mimic using equipment underground. So the person can learn a very safe environment uh, before they actually go in, in the, as shown in the picture on the top right, actually operate the equipment. Uh, iron ore, uh, the iron ore company uh, working in uh, the Labrador area mainly is, uh, has a partnership agreement with the Nunet Kavut uh, community. Excuse my pronunciation in some of these terms. I, I am from the West Coast and uh, have prepared this, but my excuse my pronunciation time to time. They were committed to uh, engaging and consulting with the Indigenous peoples, uh, and they wanted to uh, su uh, support Indigenous peoples with respect to training, education, employment, and business opportunities. Uh, and uh, they signed an agreement with the Community Council, uh, and they also opened uh, the Indigenous Service Center in Labrador West in March 2015. They're also associated with uh, both exploration, advanced exploration sites and uh, mines, goods and services contracts. So 
they need a service, they need it for a period of time, and they're going to contract it out. Uh, they could be security, could be environmental money, could be snow removal. You might have a company that's doing some sort of heavy equipment or equipment uh, work that could do snow removal on a mine site. And if you're in the, the area, that might present uh, a goods and service contracts. They will require hundreds of millions of dollars worth of mining goods and services in the province every year. Um, now, in some of this money that gets spent this way will be spent on expensive mining equipment that comes from a, some, you know, say Ontario from a produced by a major company there or from uh, other countries. So not all the money you hear about this will be uh, as accessible for local communities. Uh, an example of a 100% solely owned indigenous company that uh, has been working for um, uh, Vail with their uh, Voices Bay deposit is Nartec Holdings Limited in Happy Valley Beach Bay. Uh, they've held uh, the navigational aid maintenance contract with the Vail uh, Newfoundland company name for that uh, uh, mine since 2005. They were a nominated company, so a preferential company for the Boise Bay Mine Expansion Project. So they've had some involvement with the underground development as, as the mine has moved forward with their expansion. And they've also done something which is, we see across Canada is they've uh, gone into a partnership with Cementation Canada in 2017. So it's an Inuit owned partnership called Nortec Cementation Canada Labrador LP Limited Partnership. And they're able to use expertise and, to actually expand the business area where they can deliver services. And that's helped them uh, with respect to some of the, under, the underground development opportunities in their region. And so that's a, a model. Uh, I, I didn't come across a lot of examples of these for Newfoundland, but if you look in places like uh, Western Canada and uh, up north, that's quite common way for uh, indigenous communities to develop uh, ability to deliver more uh, uh, contract type services by getting some ex uh, expertise from an existing non-indigenous company and forming a partnership. Uh, the Inu Development Limited Partnership uh, was formed in uh, 1997 by the Shishetsu Inu Band Council Inc. and the uh, Mishu Inu uh, when they entered into a memorandum of understanding. Uh, and they wanted to get economic involvement. Uh, they wanted to minimize conflict with traditions in the area. And they wanted to increase the number of trained and employed uh, members from their uh, uh, um, groups. They became a registered limited partnership in 1999, and uh, there you can see they're comprised of council members and chiefs from the constituent communities. Uh, what's interesting is that they actually have 10 uh, partners that they list on their website. I picked the three that were more appropriate to mining. Some of those partnerships are not as are more about uh, regional transportation and other things, but they have Labrador catering, providing camp accommodations. That's uh, uh, an area that indigenous communities often get into. Uh, they have Kiwit, uh, and that's a leader in construction and engineering. So it's worked on other projects which are listed there, but it would also be uh, certainly available to do mining work. Uh, then they have their Inu Inuit uh, PDI, uh, and that's a partnership with uh, uh, the PDI company, Provincial Doors Indicate in, in, and they do apparently more than doors, but they do uh, a number of engineering types of things, including things like mining ventilation doors, uh, control systems and auxiliary equipment, which would uh, be key for um, the Boise's Bay mine and other uh, particularly underground mines. There are also indigenous community uh, mining agreements that are listed or tracked by the federal government. And uh, this is the website there is on the bottom. Uh, what you'll see is actually it shows only two of these agreements uh, that are captured for uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, and I'll, I'll talk, speak to them uh, uh, in a minute. But if you're interested in sort of ways that communities can have agreements with uh, companies um, uh, and, uh, and organizations, uh, uh, that are, they, this is a good site to go to to see the types of agreements there are available across the country and what are some of the areas they've gotten into related to mining. And so I'm just gonna show you two examples. You can look on the map and see that if we look at Quebec in particular, and if you go to Western Canada and the North, 
there are some other provinces and territories that have quite a few more of these agreements than you're currently seeing in Newfoundland and Labrador. That suggests to me that there are some opportunities here that have not been addressed yet in Newfoundland and Labrador. So here's the, uh, an impact and benefit agreement with the Labrador Inuit Association. I've just captured the information from uh, that are available when you click on that uh, location uh, from their database. Uh, and it's, there's Vail, Newfoundland and Labrador Limited, uh, producing mine. This was signed in 2002, it's still active. So it's a long lived agreement and the, the mine has another 15 years. So no reason to think it wouldn't go for that. And it just shows uh, a, a significant relationship uh, there in terms of working together. Uh, there's also one with the Nunat Kavut uh, Community Council with rare earth elements. Now this is search, uh, looking for rare earth elements is search minerals and mineral, minerals in, uh, incorporated, excuse me. They're doing exploration. This agreement was signed in 2012. But one of the, the interesting things is sometimes it can take many, you know, a decade, two decades, three decades of exploration, often by different companies to go from finding uh, some original mineralization that's interesting to actually getting enough information and having the right commodity prices to produce a mine. Uh, here in April 2002, Search Minerals Inc. is uh, starting to think they're getting close to uh, having resources that would justify doing the investment to see if they could turn it into a mine. Uh, you need to watch out for opportunities. There's a brand new Indigenous Natural Resource Partnerships Program. They've got $80 million in contributions funding. Uh, it started in November 2022. They have maybe received some applications, but no projects have been funded yet as of February 16th, and there's ongoing intake. Uh, and there's the information if, if, if that's appropriate to your uh, community of thinking of ways to uh, uh, increase the investment or collaboration between Indigenous peoples and other natural resource development stakeholders. Well, time for questions, time, times for, for answers. <laughs> if you don't have questions, I might have one or two answers uh, that you might want to consider. Or if you don't have questions, uh, I have, uh, uh, I might ask you one or two questions. Uh, back to you, Paul. Uh, we have no questions on the chat. Um, anyone um, want to pose a question now, just uh, turn on your microphone and uh, ask away. One of my questions to, to the people here, and, and obviously a lot of you are you're checking in, but I could actually ask Peter a, a demo a question, being a long-term resident and explorer uh, and uh, related to mine developments as well in, in Newfoundland. Why is there, there not more evidence, uh, at least when you go on to search online, of the Indigenous activity that's happening related to mining? Uh, there are undoubtedly more in, Aboriginal Indigenous uh, prospectors and more companies than I was able to come across in my mostly online research, but also from talking to government employees and to people like yourself. You want to well, try? I guess I, I reached out to Mining Industry NL, uh, and they told me they had tried to document some of these things, and what they found was there are. A number, uh, a fair fair number of indigenous related uh, companies working in Labrador, for example. Uh, Newfoundland's a little bit behind. Uh, we have the Halapu here, uh, the Halapu Migma band, and they are generating them. But again, the, what's happening is they are not uh, oriented specifically to mining. They're they're indigenous uh, companies that will work in construction, will work in uh, pretty well anything that, uh, that, that is being done. And mining will sometimes be part of that, for example, in the transportation, obviously in Labrador uh, specifically and in the far north in general, you have to have transportation. In fact, in exploration side, our exploration costs twice as much in Labrador as it would on the island here in Newfoundland, just because of transportation costs. So that's uh, that's sort of a typical thing. So there, while there are groups up there that are offering these things, they are not specific to to mining. So I think you just got a good uh, uh, summary on Guntu exploration, which is a Mi'kmaq uh, group, uh, Kevin Keats and uh, family, 
that uh, that are actually actually working for one company, and that's Newfound Gold. Uh, and and that is that's probably the best example we have on the island right now. Good. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. That's good. I, I actually inserted a slide, so we'll see that quickly. But I'll skip over that uh, when we come to it. Uh, Paul, just you might want to see if there's any other questions from the participants. Anyone else have a question? Otherwise, we'll just uh, let Dave continue. I will. Hearing none, I will continue. Yeah, go ahead, Dave. Yeah, so governments play a big role in exploration and mining across Canada. Uh, the provincial and territorial governments are the main governments involved with them. And so they administer the tenures, they regulate the exploration activities, they generate geoscience information, maps and reports, uh, mineral development type reports as well. They promote the resources to attract the investment. You can see the mining in uh, the future uh, 2030, they're, they're doing things uh, to attract investment to, uh, to Newfoundland and Labrador, and that investment could be coming from other parts of Canada, but in some cases it's coming from other parts around the world. And so it's, uh, that's important. They permit the mine developments in the mines, they enforce the safety regulations, and they assist with mine training. They require reclamation plants and bo reclamation bonds for the mines, so if a mine is being built, you have to, before you start it, you need to say, how am I going to reclaim it? As you move along, you have to change your plan if because the mine may uh, develop in a way that was different than anticipated in, as it start. And then you also have to re re post reclamation bonds in, uh, I think, virtually all the uh, uh, provinces and territories now, where uh, you, as you disturb more and more of the land, you give, uh, put money in a, in, a, in a safe place so that can be used if the company were to go bankrupt uh, to reclaim the site. Um, on La in Newfoundland and Labrador, on Labrador Inuit lands, there is a co-administration of mineral exploration and quarries, uh, which uh, is, uh, in some sense, it's unique across Canada. And so they are involved with that. They're not involved uh, on the more developed projects and the uh, particularly the mine, mining side and reclamation side. Federal government, they administer mineral rights on reserves. Uh, they can participate in environmental assessments of mine proposals where the, the mine has uh, large scale impacts of, uh, uh, related to oceans and the fisheries and other aspects like that. And they, they get involved to a certain extent with uranium mining, processing and shipping. Uh, there's, this, there's an incentive program, uh, 2021, uh, $1.7 million for the province. I suspect there was one in 2022, but um, I just caught this information. So mineral land rights, prospectors and explorers contain the rights to the mineral resources in the ground. They're now acquired online in Newfoundland and Labrador, the way they are in several other provinces uh, and territories across the country. That's new, it used to be you went out on the land and you put in posts and you walked the perimeter of the area you were acquiring and you submitted a map. Uh, this minerals, metals and mineral staking is now done through uh, a, a computer portal. And so it's the advantages to that is the, actually a more accurate location than the historical way. But also it means that any interested party can go online and see where there are mineral claims. And that's important in indigenous communities to know if there's an interest in some of the land base near your community. There is no staking of mineral claims on Indian reserves or exempt areas. Uh, such as ecological reserves or provincial parks. Early expiration requires permits, uh, just listing some, uh, and shows you know there are costs to acquiring the tenures. Uh, and there's very good information from the Newfoundland and Labrador government uh, to tell you, tell you about this if you're interested in learning more about that. Uh, there's also good government support, particularly for prospectors in uh, the province, and. Uh, that's very good to see. Prospectors have made many of the historic discoveries and still, as you'll hear a little bit later, making discoveries today that are important to finding new mines. Uh, for advanced exploration and mining, uh, suddenly you're gonna have more land, you're gonna have significant land disturbance like trenches, roads, drilling, camps, and these require uh, permits that are in some cases specific to that activity. 
Uh, the applicant has to design programs to address both environmental and safety concerns. There'll be setbacks from sensitive areas. Uh, mine developments will require approvals from the provincial government. In some cases, the federal government, that's what I was mentioning before. Uh, and also, yeah, I mentioned that uh, on elaborate or inlet lands, the applicant must apply to the government as well for um, exploration and quarries. I'm not going to address this. I don't have it, the time today, but mining opportunities can come with concerns. Thinking when we get past early exploration into mine, uh, advanced exploration or mine development projects, and then the mines themselves, uh, these are, can be fairly significant operations and there can uh, be su uh, significant land disturbance. And so uh, as uh, indigenous uh, people from indigenous communities or Canadians in general, we want to ask questions about how a mine development program is going to impact uh, the local environment, what plans there are for reclamation, and you want to learn about the mineral exploration and mining operations. But that's not uh, what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about economic development opportunities, uh, and uh, we would need another speaker for that. So life cycle of mining, what you see is prospecting and early exploration, mineral exploration, mine development, mining, and then mine closure and reclamation. This is a mining life cycle. Uh, if you go back 50 years, 100 years, they often didn't think about uh, the mine closure and reclamation. And in many cases, they were smaller mines and people, the commodity price dropped, they left the mine there site as it was because they assumed they might come back and remine it. But they, we now, the, the final stage, mine closure and reclamation is a key part. More importantly, there are indigenous business opportunities for all of these. And in fact, for mine closure and reclamation, indigenous communities can often be one of the best groups to be uh, involved in monitoring activities and reclamation activities because they live in the area. Uh, they're, um, they have a vested interest in protecting the land. Early exploration starts with an idea or discovery. Uh, the prospect of finding a rock, a company deciding to work near a, a recent discovery or following up with some government data that says, let's explore here. I'm just showing some visible gold there. Uh, it's, uh, I have a, my own little piece of visible gold that I have from the SNP gold mine in BC. It's actually very hard to find visible gold. And that's why that little black circle is cir circling in. That would be enough to get a prospector or a geologist quite excited uh, if it was in an area where they hadn't found gold before. Uh, Boise's Bay, it's a great story with the wrong exploration, excellent discovery. The people who were exploring there were looking for diamonds, uh, but they found this first mineralization with nickel, copper, copper and cobalt in it uh, that eventually became the Boise's Bay de uh, deposit. Diamond Resources, the company was, uh, had the wrong idea, but the excellent discovery received $4.3 billion when they sold it to Vail in uh, 1996. So, uh, and it uh, took a while for that deposit to get developed because there were negotiations with the government and with the indigenous people in the area. Uh, the um, uh, prospectors have play, play a, a big role across the country and certainly in Newfoundland uh, for uh, mineral exploration. And this just sort of talks about how they work. Um, they tend not to use mechanized equipment. Uh, they tend not to have a big impact on, uh, on the land surface. Uh, and there's about 300 members in the Newfoundland and Labrador Prospectors Association, so there's lots of them there. I'm actually convinced there's quite a few Indigenous prospectors, both past and present, associated with uh, Newfoundland. Matty Mitchell was uh, a very successful prospector, Indigenous one, and discovered the Buckins ore body, which is a, a very big but now closed mine. Indigenous prospectors, I had this slide in and then got some information just <laughs> last night. Uh, about uh, potential uh, uh, work that they're doing. So the Keats family has many prospectors, uh, not just the people listed there, but grandchildren, great grandchildren, cousins, in-laws. They discovered several mines in a deposit. More recently, they found a gold-rich boulder. I think it was 54 ounces per gold ton in the boulder. And they, the, Alan and Kevin Keats went out to look for the source. The boulder had been found quite a while ago by Fred. They decided to go out and they found made a discovery which resulted in a drill discovery by newfound gold of the high grade heat zone. And that's driven, that excitement around that discovery has really sort of created the current gold rush, if you will, for Newfoundland. Um, there's Gun 2 Resources Limited. 
Uh, it's a registered company. It means rock in the Micmac language. And they currently have 40 employees and the number of vehicles working on the uh, advanced mineral exploration site of newfound gold. And uh, what occurred to me this was that Kevin Keats is wearing a prospector hat, a Kevin, a director hat, and a field and logistics manager for Newfound Gold. He's uh, doing a lot of things these days. So mineral exploration path, prospecting, geochemistry, which means taking samples of soil or till or rock and analyzing to see if you can find either the metals you're chasing or what they call pathfinder elements that indicate you're on the right track. Geophysics, looking for uh, signals in the ground, uh, from the ground, and drilling. Drilling is a key element in exploration these days because the deposits we're finding are almost always buried, and so you need to drill to get data about them. Um, who does it? Small companies, relatively small number of employees. They could be in a city, they typically have a single office, Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal. Quite a few of the companies working on Newfoundland are from Vancouver. Most do not own a mine. Their stocks trades for cents to a few dollars. And many of them exist for less than five years. They get bought out, they change the name, or they fold. Uh, and there's three that are currently working. I mentioned search in, and there's Newfound Gold Corp uh, working in the province. Um, and geologists do examinations of it and they play a role early on in early exploration. Uh, they'll collect, there's the samples, there's some soil samples, till sampling, uh, lake sediment sampling. That's a person on the edge of a, I think a helicopter that's just landed on floats in the lake and they're uh, collecting sediment from underneath the water there. Uh, trenching to see and sample the bedrock uh, just uh, it gives you more uh, specific information for, for it. Airborne geophysical surveys are done early on. They cover large areas using uh, airborne methods. And they're looking for things like magnetism to give them ideas of where to look. They usually, occasionally they can find evidence of, of a buried mineral deposit. More, more often they use, help the geologists decide where, where to look on the ground. This is a picture from a camp, a fairly small camp. I didn't have one for um, Newfoundland and Labrador. Just showing the number of people associated with a smaller early stage mineral exploration camp. Uh, types of jobs there are listed, uh, and a number of those would be entry level jobs where they might, uh, you might be a prospector's helper or you'd be trained as a line cutter on the site or as a sampler. So, good entry level jobs. Um, if we look at the early ones compared to the more advanced exploration programs, they're, they're still spending significant money, but it might be 50,000 to millions of dollars versus hundreds of millions of dollars on an advanced exploration site. Uh, these early ones may, may only survive for one or two years uh, unless they get good results. The other ones can go on for multiple years. Uh, generally limited viral impacts for the early ones, whereas more significant ones for the major ones. So ground geophysics, uh, diamond drilling, this is road accessible. And so uh, Newfoundland for sure has lots of areas where you have forestry roads or other roads that can be used to provide access. But uh, in Labrador, the picture on the right, and some part, certain parts of Newfoundland uh, use helicopter access. That's what it looks like looking down a drill hole with a rod in it, and there's some drill core coming out of the drill. Here's a geologist just logging it. This, there, this is a little bit like you took a, a straw and stuck it into a birthday cake, which has layers in it. You're gonna, the drill hole shows you the layers in the rock, and if there's a uh, a zone in there which is mineralized, uh, you'll see it and you'll be able to track it uh, underground. Uh, core boxes is something that is a very uh, interesting project that uh, uh, indigenous companies can get involved early on. It doesn't require a significant um, investment of capital. Uh, all these exploration projects will need core boxes and if they can buy it locally, they will. I didn't have an example for Labrador. This is from BC, the tall tans. Uh, uh, and it's just a, a very small company uh, set up to do that. Where are these people staying? Well, they have exploration camps like the bottom one left from Labrador, another one with a helicopter there, uh, I think also from Labrador. Whoops. Uh, uh, then, and, but for a large uh, exploration camp, this is the Valentine Lake Gold Project uh, the, uh, near Millertown in, in Newfoundland. Then. You can see this is, it's an exploration camp, but it's looking pretty large here. There's uh, been quite a bit of uh, ac activity there. And that's in part because they got to the stage where they actually are beyond exploration and they're now into the mine development stage. 
Um, Marathon Gold, uh, and I'm just going to show you some in its first with showing the life cycle of mining, some of the agreements and contracts and services. And this is Marathon Gold with the Kalapu Mi'kmaq First Nations. They've signed a socioeconomic agreement. And you can see both sides seeing benefits coming out of this. Uh, and we're seeing more and more of these uh, across Canada. Uh, you also see small companies that are indigenous uh, where I assume they talk about mining engineering and they're talking about drone survey and mapping that while they don't really profile it and it's not known by other people that they're actually getting some work through uh, mineral exploration and mining. Drones have become quite a popular way of uh, capturing both images and doing geophysical surveys locally in exploration and it's low impact. Life cycle of mining. So we talked about prospecting early exploration. Uh, we're going to talk talked about mineral exploration. Now we're going to talk about mine development. And mine development is a time when the most people are employed on site. You have a big surge as you have uh, people doing construction, you have people doing environmental studies, you have people doing all sorts of things. And when you actually get to mining it, you, the number of uh, people on site will actually drop significantly, maybe 20, 30 percent from the mine development stage. Uh, and so, yeah. So evaluation, how do you decide whether you want to put out the huge capital cost picking for a large metal mine, uh, a large iron ore mine? Well, you need, is, you need to think, is this resource going to be economical by the time I get it into production? So it's the type of mineral. It's the market price of the minerals and metals uh, and the predicted future price of those minerals and metals. It's a location. If it's good, has good accessibility uh, uh, and it's the right kind of terrain, then the, the cost of accessing the resource will be less. Um, in some cases, you have to build airstrips. Are you going to be able to afford to use that type of transportation to make your and keep your mine economic? Distance from marks, markets and supply points, the regulatory regime. It is possible in, in some cases, uh, jurisdictions have made mines uneconomic by taxing them too heavily. Uh, is it environmentally safe and socially responsible mining? They have to be thinking about that in a modern situation such as Canada and the availability of a qualified workforce. If they don't have a workforce, they don't have a productive mine. So who's doing mid-sized mine developments in Newfoundland? Well, Maritime Resources and Matador Mining would claim are at the point where they want to move from the exploration to the mining side. Uh, in Canada, we often see, speaking for smaller metal mines, it's small to mid-sized companies that are developing them. Uh, sand and gravel pits and some quarries are actually really simple, relatively simple to permit and develop. So they will be much smaller companies and take less time, just a reference to them. Uh, the gold and other metal properties tend to be more complex. So they can take years, and I've mentioned sometimes a decade with on and off expiration to get to an, a resource that's economic. Um, a larger company may take over a mine as it approaches production. So mine development path, environmental assessments, bulk samples. So in this case, they've had to go underground at a gold mine in Newfoundland, a potential gold mine, I should say. And they've got to sample that white quartz vein, which has uh, gold in it, to see if when they actually start mining it, uh, will there be enough uh, gold recovered out of it? They need a bigger sample than they can get from the surface work they've done. Uh, they have to spend money on economic feasibility studies to justify uh, raising the funds. They have to actually go out and have people who raise the funds, and they obviously have to get government permits. And then they have to prepare for the mining. And so there's a stage where they've got the money, they've got the permits, but you're actually in the mine development preparing for money. And so there's a, they're assembling some mining equipment there to go ahead and mine. Environmental studies during this stage, mine development stage, there'll be more extensive environmental sampling and monitoring of the property. More of a focus on surface water, fish and wildlife for baseline data. Uh, and this information will all have to be provided to government agencies um, as part of the mine development process. This is the Valentine Gold Project. Uh, they got their first mineral resource in 2010 and they revised 10 times until they, the last one in 2021. And so it's taken them quite a while to establish that they actually had a resource and they had the right uh, sort of environment in terms of the price of the commodities and understanding of how to mine it to go ahead. On this uh, sketch here, I hope you can see my, I think you can see my arrow. There are three small open pits. There are waste dumps. 
there's a tailings area, there's a plant site, there's a campsite because of its uh, location, the workers uh, will be on, on site and there's a road network. So quite a bit of, of planning for it. There's just some pictures of grubbing and tree removal and where they're gonna be doing one of the, the first pits. They had to replace a rib bridge. They got a, a, need to have a water system, both for the uh, processing plant, the mill, and also for the camp. Um, they started developing their first leprechaun pit, so they can see some some of the early trucks. They're starting to remove some of the surface materials, which will, uh, including the soils, which will be stockpiled. They're building a, a haul rock, uh, haul road construction. They're putting in a permanent camp. Uh, one of the interesting things uh, about uh, many uh, many companies now working in Canada, they're starting to think much more about uh, how they relate to. Uh, the communities and the, the province they're in. So they're talking about social comp, capital, economic impact, the environment, and human capital. And if you look up here, you can see they have an socioeconomic agreement with the Kalapu Mi'kmaq First Nation and an MOU with the Maopuket uh, First Nation. So they're, they're uh, trying to be very responsible in how they develop this project. Uh, they've made a commitment to get local uh, uh, make local commitments and contracts to, uh, sorry, uh, Marathon Gold made the commitment, not, um, uh, uh, and anyway, uh, oh yeah, so Marathon Gold Development, sorry, Gold Project made this commitment. And if you go on their website, you can see who they've listed. I just picked out, they've listed, there's been, oh, uh, at least 20 or 30 contracts they've already awarded. Unfortunately, I can't tell, a number of these are not, I don't think, Indigenous, but uh, they are committed to local contracts, including a number with Indigenous communities. Uh, larger mine developments, these operate for a decade or more, hundreds to over a thousand mine-related employees of big operations at present. These are the iron and nickel mines in Newfoundland. Uh, they're usually owned by large international companies. Uh, the one's uh, iron ore company, uh, it's, uh, it's become Rio Tinto, iron ore company, and Inco, they're available with Boise's Bay. Uh, they'll start with uh, uh, a developed resource. Uh, they have something that they think they can sell uh, and they'll have an, an estimated mine life. This is for uh, the Houston iron deposits in the Shepherdville area. Uh, they proposed a Houston mine plan and they've got government permits. They need to construct a gravel road and new rail siding. They got to get, it's subject to them raising the money to do it. And what you see here is again, 2011 submission, 2030 finally approved by both provincial and federal, uh, provincial and federal governments. Uh, and yet the mine still hasn't been, they haven't started mine development yet because they uh, want to do a pre-feasibility study to see if in 2022, can they make this investment and actually get money out of it? So it can take quite a while for one of these uh, mine development projects to get underway. Uh, and the risks are, that uh, there would be falling demand for the product. Increased competition leads to falling prices. So increased competition is the key element. Challenges at a new mine. It's, every time it's a new mine, there, you, you can find things that make it uh, more of a challenge than you anticipate to develop it. And there are other risks out there. So they're doing it. Um, the Labrador Iron uh, or Mines uh, Company is, uh, has relationships with First Nations and they've been working on this for quite a while. And that just shows you some of the relationships that they've built in the area. Certainly when you have, they have more than one mine. And so that makes it easier for them over a period of time to build a relationship with local communities. Uh, here's some examples of uh, uh, indigenous companies working on mine development. So this is a uh, scaffold solutions uh, company and uh, they've uh, done work not uh, uh, related, uh, not just to mining, but to other areas as well. There is uh, a limited partnership, the SQA2, and they've done construction, mechanical contracting, electrical contracting, and so on, uh, and they're in Happy Valley Goose Bay. So I assume that they've done work uh, with uh, uh, Boise's Bay with Vail, but uh, couldn't actually find that for sure, but they certainly would be capable of doing work with them. Uh, another partnership here, uh, and they're uh, doing, uh, uh, again, in Happy Valley Goose Bay, and so I assume that they've been involved with some of the mine development uh, in that area. So we're, gonna, we're getting closer to the end here. I apologize, we're going 
perhaps I'll start a little bit later. We're going to be a little bit uh, longer than I anticipated originally. So what I'm showing here is that there are, for every thousand properties staked in a general idea, there's just hundreds of them become mineral exploration properties. So if you see ground that's been staked, it doesn't automatically mean that anybody's ever going to be find the money to go and do the mineral exploration, particularly if it's in a more remote area. Those hundreds of mineral exploration properties are only going to become several mine development projects in a, a reasonable period of time, like 30 or 40 years. Uh, and then what we see is if we go to actually mining, if we're talking about metal mines, not sand and gravel pits or quarries that are easy to refine, but if we're talking about metal mines like Boise's Bay, uh, like some of the gold mines in, in Newfoundland, it's uh, the general estimate is that you might just find one, one metal mine. And I must admit these statistics are more based on what's happening in Western Canada than Newfoundland. So for these smaller gold mines, maybe you might get more than one. But what it shows is there's a, a lot of risk associated with this that you start with the expiration, but you may not ever get it to be a mine. And that's a, becomes a, something important to keep in the back of your mind uh, that first, just because you see expiration doesn't mean there ever be a mine there, but also it does mean there is, a, it's, a, it's a very complicated and demanding task to go from look, thinking I should be exploring here to actually finding something you can mine. Uh, here's the Pine Cove Gold Mine Complex for Vanaconda Mining. So it's, it was in production 2009 to 2020. You can see the open pit, the plant site. This is a tailings impoundment area here. And uh, the, it's uh, actually became the plant that's now pres was as pro processing ore from the Argyle open pit. And there's the Argyle Gold Mine. It started uh, mining in 2020. It's going to stop this year, uh, and it's using the Pine Cove. Uh, plant. So, and that's a case of a small gold mine using existing facilities and reducing their impact. Uh, iron ore company mine operation, extracting iron from the open pit. Just going to sort of show you quickly what that looks like. So, they strip the overlying soil and store it for later reclamation to blast the rock. They'll take any rock that's obviously waste rock with no iron and put that in waste rocks, uh, uh, waste piles. And so they blast. Uh, this is now they're into an area where actually you can see the reddish color there where they're into ore, iron ore, uh, which they're going to mine and they load the trucks up. The trucks are going to head to the processing plant. So you can see quite a large infrastructure here. This is where they stockpile the, the um, iron ore and, and some of the rock that's with it to go into the processing plant. They have to uh, crush that ore up to separate the iron ore from the rock. Uh, very high tech operation, lots of uh, technical stuff in multiple place, places in this process where they're tracking what's happening and they're producing both iron uh, uh, granules and pellets to, to be shipped. That's shipped by train to set eel, uh, then stockpiled and loaded on uh, ships to go to other places in North America and around the world. So now I'm gonna to talk to you about mine closure and reclamation. Uh, the, the final part of the life cycle. And again, as mentioned, indigenous uh, business opportunities through the entire uh, period of this. I do need to mention that Newfoundland and Labrador, like other part, places in Canada and around the world, has some orphaned and abandoned mine sites. These are old mine sites uh, that were left after, uh, uh, and did not see proper closure. In some cases, owners hope to reopen the mine uh, and many of these are small and they don't really represent environmental problems or more of safety hazards. You can think of small underground mines chasing uh, some gold, but they were not very successful. Um, but Newfoundland has some larger abandoned mines that have significant environmental problems. Uh, the, the provincial government has reclaimed some and is working on others. Uh, they've done quite a bit of work on both the Bay Vert asbestos mine and the former Consolidated Rambler project. And you can find information about this on their website. Uh, but it is one of the challenges, not just in uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, but uh, across the country. Holbrook Mine is one of the abandoned mine sites that's now reclaimed. Um, it's a case where the company uh, went into receivership and then it became just the responsibility of the government, Newfoundland and Labrador. And there is a problem with acid mine drainage. So the province in between 2000 and 2004 went in to treat that problem, but also do other rec reclamation. Uh, interesting enough, 
there is potential to find more gold there. So there are people who have been doing, uh, doing or considering doing uh, mineral exploration for gold on the property. Uh, one of the things actually in the industry is the best place to find a new mine is close to an old mine. So that's a little bit uh, sort of confirming that sort of thought for those explorationists. So here's a heap leach dam sort of picking a specific uh, part of that project, which you can't see in that larger picture. And here it's looking, it's after reclamation, it's still partially vegetated. One would assume that that vegetation is going to spread more uh, completely over that area to uh, reclaim, help reclaim that site. Uh, modern mine closure includes removing all the mine buildings, ensuring the site is safe, completing reclamation, meeting environmental conditions for the site, meeting land use objectives. So the, that's uh, be part of what the government has negotiated with uh, the mine at the start. In some cases, uh, some mines actually lead to an improved land use outcome for a specific area on that site, benefiting local communities, uh, satisfying all the government regulators. Uh, it usually. For bigger mines, there'll be monitoring site post closure. That's an a, a excellent example for indigenous companies to get involved with. And in some cases, unfortunately, there's ongoing remediation is necessary. Uh, some more examples. So here's uh, on the Shepherdfield area. See the open pit on the left? Uh, that's been flooded and that's been reclaimed, and uh, there's been some work done around the edges of the pit. Uh, they will have also, uh, in reclaiming there and also their silver yard site, they all have. Uh, reclaimed and covered areas with soil in certain areas and reclaiming it. Uh, Iron Ore Canada, their tailings, uh, they, they're, they've covered the tailings that's no longer being used and they've receded with grasses. Uh, there's a waste dump down in here and you can see that uh, here's the, the rocks and they're covering the waste dump and, and trying to vegetate the areas to uh, reclaim it. Uh, duck pond closure is a great one with tech. I don't have any pictures with it, but they, they began operations in 2007 and knew they were likely to close in 2015. So they were talking to the com community about that and their employees all the way through the mining. They had three phases to it and they're almost at the end of uh, the reclamation uh, process. Now, I'm just gonna shift to the last part here uh, for those of you who are still uh, hanging in here. I want, with the, for economic development officers, the, there's three ABCs of mining there are many ABCs, but there are three I thought I would talk about. One is increasing indigenous involvement in mining. Another one is the promotion required to develop new resources. And the other one is the time to find, permit, and build a major mine, which I've mentioned a couple of times during the presentation. So if you want to increase indigenous mining involvement in mining, it, there's a very logical way here to start. Get employment. And that's actually happening in, all across Canada. And it's happening in, in Newfoundland and Labrador. Get involved in the approvals process for exploration and mine development. So you're aware of it, so you're, you're participating and make sure the land is being considered. Uh, look for indigenous company contracts. Look for agreements with the companies themselves that are like impact benefit agreements or social economic agreements. Look for cooperation and in infrastructure. Some uh, in, uh, indigenous communities, some First Nations uh, have, uh, some Inuit communities actually have an ability to participate in the development and benefit from it by actually having, if you cooperate in infrastructure, you can have an ownership position. And shared benefits of ownership go directly to on that route. That, that's a route to having uh, increasing. Employment is almost always the best way to start if you haven't had involvement before, but there's a sequence there. Promotion is required to develop these new resources. If you're, you don't have a company that can promote itself and attract the investment, it'll never happen. If a province or a territory can attract those investors, uh, then there'll be fewer mine developments. And if you're interested in mine developments as part of your economic development plan. Um, uh, and so indigenous and, and other communities can play a role in that, but it's just, it is a, a critical element. You have to be um, aware that sometimes the companies can be over enthusiastic. They'll say, we've got a mine here. And yet uh, it would require quite a bit more work to actually prove that there's a mine there. So it's uh, uh, some companies and some individuals will be over promoting, but in a general, and we, some of us may have a negative feeling about promotion, but if you're not attracting investors, if you're not letting people know why this uh, mine development should go ahead, uh, you're not, you're not gonna get to the end objective. The other one is it takes time to find, permit and build a major mine these days in Canada. And that's all due to good process and government involvement. 
raising the capital, uh, people banking it, being worried about social uh, license. But it takes three years for a, a major mine, it takes maybe three years to explore and define the resource. We've seen some examples where it's taking way more than three years. Might take you two or three years to get permits, and that takes you two years to construct. Uh, and all those are sort of average to uh, minimum times if you're talking about minimum. Well, that's all in fine and dandy, dandy if the metal prices stay high and your investment funds are still available. But if you turn into a, a, a slowdown because of prices falling or you get stalled because your company is focusing on something else or you just stop and you can't restart, if that window of opportunity is not there, uh, you're not gonna have the funds to pursue the mine permits and construction. So it's just, there. that's just an element of that a thousand properties that have been staked ending up with one or two uh, potential mines. It's just, uh, so it's just, you uh, just need to be aware that everybody could be thinking that this property is gonna go through and get in the mine permits and be constructed, but there are a number of reasons why that might be put on the shelf for a period of time or might never happen. Doesn't mean you can't benefit from the, the mineral exploration phase. So lots of information online uh, from Newfoundland and Labrador government. Uh, I mentioned their annual report. There's online access for all sorts of information, uh, not just the mineral claims, but geoscience information. Uh, and um, uh, we will be posting this listing as a separate, more readable list on the uh, Can Do webinar site, uh, probably in about a week's time uh, when we uh, made sure we've got all the links we want and it's in a better format than this last one. Uh, and I would suggest you might want to watch or download other mining web webinars from the CanDo website for examples of indigenous companies or partnerships related to mining. Uh, if you're trying, if you're interested in that, uh, you can download the, the, the presentation without the, the, my voiceover, but as a PDF, so you can actually fairly quickly go through it and find that kind of information. And Paul, back to you for if there's any questions and people had the patience to sit and listen through this webinar. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, appreciate all your knowledge um, and experience in sharing that with us. Um, if anyone has any questions, uh, now's the chance. Seize the day, as they say. Where's this one here? Thing of sheer screen. Um, Peter Dimmel here. Could I just uh, add a little bit there to uh, some of Dave's comments? Certainly. Yeah, okay, uh, just a couple of things, like the Hope Brook mine uh, that Dave mentioned uh, that was reclaimed. Interestingly enough, uh, the company that owns that just came out with a new resource yesterday with a million and a half ounces. Uh, so uh, it, it, sometimes you can reclaim these a little too fast. Um, that, the, certainly, that company certainly could have used the, uh, some of the infrastructure that was there uh if it hadn't been reclaimed so you have to be a little careful about those type of things uh it, it, most mines uh when they close aren't necessarily completely uh depleted of their resource uh as uh, as dave did mention uh, prices go up and down so companies can close because the price is down and uh you can't do much. Uh, you can't do much with it to make money at the time, and they just can't go on. But another company comes back in when the price goes up and uh, can mine it again. So uh, it, it's it's something. It, our business is not the easiest one. Uh, we are price takers. We are not price makers. We cannot set the price for our commodities. It doesn't matter whether it's copper, lithium, uh, gravel, sand, or whatever it is. We you know, it, it is dependent upon what, the, what in most cases, what the world price is, what, what somebody somewhere else says the price is going to be. So uh, you have to keep that in mind when you're working on it. We're a good industry, but we're one of the few that is really dependent upon that, uh, that sort of thing. So anyway, just keep that in mind. Thank you for sharing, Peter. Um, there was a question from Olga on the chat. Uh, do you have a centralized list of indigenous businesses in Labrador, Newfoundland? Um, unfortunately, there isn't one. Um, the best you can do is um, 
compiled um, um, the Indigenous Business Directory list from um, Indigenous Services Canada and perhaps um, regional organizations like um, um, ACOA, um, the Atlantic um, Opportunity. Um, I'm not sure what ACOA stands for, but they're um, they're a regional representative and they and they support uh, business development and so on. Um, it's oh, A C O A. Is, yeah, ACOA is the Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Um, yeah, Paul. What I would say is that based on my experience in preparing for this webinar, is that uh, uh, for whatever reason, the province does not. There, there, you, you really can't go anywhere at this point in time and find that list. Uh, and so it's uh, it's uh, which is different than for some of the other jurisdictions across Canada that I'm I'm aware of, and. Um, um uh, it's uh particularly for i think particularly for newfoundland uh as peter was mentioning it it sort of reflects just where they are and uh, uh i guess i would hope that either the provincial government or uh, some other agency might decide well let's really try and uh find uh you know get more companies to identify as as being indigenous and having a connection to mining than you can find right now because there are there are besides the governments there is a Canadian Aboriginal Directory, and they have 19 entries for Newfoundland and Labrador, but about 17 of them are organizations that are list all the provinces and all the territories for Canada. So they're not specific to Newfoundland and they're not based in Newfoundland or Labrador. So uh, it's, uh, we're just, uh, to, at least at, as far as I know, there is no good listing. And, uh, and I guess it's sort of shown up because I asked somebody like, Peter, who helped me a, a lot with this, you know, getting, getting a better sense of um, uh, information for this presentation, and then asking the, the Newfoundland and Labrador government, which is pretty proactive about a lot of things, and they're not coming up with uh, lists of companies. So it's uh, uh, it's a bit of a problem right now, but it's an opportunity for somebody to go ahead and address it because they they're out there, just like the prospectors, they're out there, they're just not in a list anywhere. I think that's something we can follow up with the government on. Uh, I, I, the, uh, there's no doubt that uh, I, I was surprised when I started checking into it for you, Dave. I, I just assumed there would be a list, and uh, uh, I was quite surprised when there wasn't. So I think that's something that we can push the government on. The government is pushing mining and mineral exploration, and they're also pushing uh, in Labrador specifically uh, much more than the island because the island is fairly active with with things anyway but labrador the that is one of the real opportunities for the aboriginal groups in labrador um, that's going to continue uh, they're talking about putting new roads in up to the north up to the coast of labrador up to the northernmost community of nain uh, if that does that'll open up new ground and there'll be new stuff uh, new mineral deposits found so it's going to go you know, it's going to continue. So we'll push for that a lot. Good. Michael just shared a link to um, Aboriginal business from the chamber. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah, business. I'm copying all these links. Thank you very much. Very good. Um, okay, so I want to just uh, quickly thank everyone that participated today. Um, thank you for sharing your time with us. And um, sharing your thoughts and sharing your questions um, uh, about uh, the opportunities in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, thank you, Dave, uh, again, for your wonderful um, presentation and sharing of your knowledge. Uh, this presentation um, recording will be available later today. And as Dave mentioned, the list of resources uh, will be compiled and will be shared uh, probably within the week um, once it's all organized and formatted. Uh, it can all be found at edo.ca under the main menu bar that says EDO tools. So thank you all. Thank you, Dave. Uh, have a good day. Yeah.